Good morning or good afternoon if you happen to be in Europe or Africa. Welcome to this virtual Reuters newsmaker with Kristalina Georgieva, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. I'm Rob Cox, the Global Editor of Reuters Breaking Views in Zurich, and I'm joined in today's conversation by our Global Economics Editor, Swaha Patnaik in London. Hello, Swaha. Hey, Rob. One housekeeping note. For those of you out there, if you'd like to pose a question during our chat today, please use the Q&A widget that those of you who are registered in advance should be able to see on your screens. We will have a few minutes after the half hour to pose some of them to the managing director. This is the fourth virtual session that we've done during the pandemic and coincides with a book my colleagues at Breaking News recently published looking at what will change, what will happen after the disease and the great lockdown as the IMF has famously dubbed it. Uh, have passed. So please go to breakingviews.com or check on your icon screen to download a PDF of Once in a Lifetime. We're really honored to have Ms. Georgieva with us today. She took over the multilateral lender in October of last year after a stint as acting president of the World Bank, where she was also the chief executive from 2017. Prior to that, she was vice president of the European Commission, where she also served in a variety of important roles, including commissions overseeing international cooperation and development, and perhaps most appropriate to the current environment, humanitarian aid and crisis management. Welcome, Kristalina. It's great to have you. I might suggest that last role I mentioned prepared you best for the last few months of the, the world has grappled with the coronavirus. Are you having are you having fun yet? I guess is the question. Well, the um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, yes, uh, being uh, in charge of crisis response. Uh, did prepare me for this job. Uh, and I'll tell you the most important thing I learned in these years uh, was pray for the best, but prepare for the worst. Uh, and always uh, uh, focus on action rather than on uh, reflecting on what it might have been if the crisis were not to hit us. Yeah, I mean, before we jump into some of the really beefy stuff like the economic outlook and that kind of thing, I mean, just sort of a stepping back, you know, you have been a very visible presence throughout this crisis. I, I see you uh, speaking, you know, communicating quite regularly. I'm just, I, my sense is, I just wonder if this is part of a strategy in a way to sort of reposition the IMF as a proactive, friendly face instead of a sort of more forbidding, austerity imposing presence, as arguably was the perception a few years ago. I mean, is that interpretation correct? Well, it is two things. One is, um, uh, going back to, I have served as crisis uh, commissioner, I can see it coming. And my staff uh, also can reflect on how serious, how deep this crisis is going to be fairly early. And it is a duty to serve to be out there and lean forward in this crisis with all the resources the IMF has, both financial resources and intellectual uh, resources. And it is also uh, to continue from uh, where my predecessor has been taking the fund, and it is an organization uh, that is above all about people. Uh, it is... Uh, not what uh, the image of the fund is. Uh, and uh, indeed, yes, I want to change this image further, not because of, for, of us, but because it is so important that countries come early to the fund. They don't hesitate. If they need that help, we are there uh, for them. Swaha, over to you. Thank you, Rob. Let me ask you, your watchword is hope for the best, prepare for the worst. We've had something like $17 trillion worth of monetary and fiscal stimulus, I think, on your last count, thrown at the global economy to help cope with the pandemic's economic impact. You yourself have a trillion, as you've often said, of resource, tr trillion dollars of resources. The problem is you've just this week, unfortunately, had to cut your economic growth forecast for this year mm. and next year. 
So in this sense and spirit of prepare for the worst, if this crisis persists, say there are third or you know, second, third wave infections, the fund may need extra resources. Could you just lay out for us some of the options and how you feel about your preference amongst those? Well, the uh, uh, starting point in answering your, your question uh, is uh, that this is a crisis like no other. We have not experienced anything like this uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, and it is only right that we deploy a response like no other. Uh, and it is uh, exactly what we are uh, seeing being, being done. Why we call it a crisis like no other? Well, of course, the magnitude is uh, very severe. Uh, we, it is a deeper recession than we predicted in April, and at that time it was a very dire scenario, minus 3%. Now we are saying it is actually going to be more likely minus 4.9%. This is our current assessment. Uh, and it is a crisis in which the most difficult issue to wrestle with is uncertainty. Still plenty of it ahead of us. Uh, it is uncertainty about the behavior of the virus. Yes, we now know more what the threat is, how we can handle it. It is also uncertainty around the uh, uh, speed with which different countries are being affected and how the uh, response to the, uh, to the epidemics would work out. Uh, but I want to focus on the action side. Yes, we have seen unprecedented response, and thank God it has put a floor under our economies. Uh, it has created also space, breathing space for emerging markets. Why? Because the tremendous liquidity that is now available because of primarily actions of major central banks, has made it possible for countries with good fundamentals to return to markets, issue bonds at very competitive cost. That is a very welcoming uh, impact of the uh, actions taken. But there are also unintended consequences of these actions. First and foremost, the fact that what we are seeing is uh, uh, some disconnect between where markets are in a happier place and where the real economy is, uh, quite uh, quite sober picture for this year and next. We expect for 2020, 2021, a total loss because of this crisis of staggering $12 trillion. And yet, markets are indicating that they are, you know, returning pretty much to where they were before we were uh, hit. Uh, so we have to be vigilant to recognize that the worst of the shock is behind us. We are now in a better place understanding this crisis and acting upon it. But there are still quite a number of uncertainties, vulnerabilities to zero on. And if we do so, we can come across on the other side with less scarring and in a better overall position. Can I just ask you then go, to go back for the next phase to ensure there's less scarring? And once um, you know, mm -hmm. the one trillion has started to be deployed, do you think it would be necessary to have a little more firepower available just in case you needed it? And how mm -hmm. would you want that to be raised? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, our philosophy at the fund uh, from the uh, uh, moment we realize there is a big shock coming uh, has been uh, do rapidly the uh, most important action that would help the world to stabilize. So what we have done so far, three very big things. One, we have doubled emergency financing and we have deployed this provision of, of 
financial lifelines to a staggering number of countries, 72 in just slightly over seven weeks. That for countries with weaker fundamentals in particular has been absolutely essential so they can pay their doctors and nurses and they can protect the most vulnerable people and the most vulnerable parts of their economies. Two, we have worked on a initiative for debt relief uh, for countries, for low income countries, essential. Now we have the uh, debt uh, service suspension initiative of the G20. And we also inside the fund did something very important for our poorest members. We generated grants that we give them so they can serve their duties, their obligations to the fund over the next months. Why is this critical? Because when the economy is in a standstill, poor countries would face a dramatic choice between serving their debt or saving the lives of their people. And the third thing we did, and we talk less about it, but it is so important, is we created uh, what we call a policy action tracker for 193 countries, we collect actions they have taken to respond to this crisis in one place, and then we can very quickly transmit knowledge from one country to another. And I, and I can proudly say that uh, it has accelerated this dramatic, powerful response, uh, and it has helped countries to learn what works best so they can they can apply it now looking into the future uh, we still have uh, about three quarter of our lending capacity available so the total we have uh, provided uh, before this crisis and during this crisis uh, amounts to 250 billion dollars uh, by the way, one of the things we did in this uh, period of time is to expand flexible credit lines for countries with very strong fundamentals. So we renewed Colombia, we added Peru and Chile, and we also have Mexico. So we have $107 billion in a very useful way as a additional insurance for strong uh, economies with strong fundamentals. Now, we have three quarters still available to lend. And you're saying, are you worried this may not be enough? Well, reading our most uh, uh, recent um, uh, projections, uh, uh, I wouldn't put it uh, uh, beyond us that we might be in a place uh, where the IMF uh, resources are being tested, but we are not there yet. And uh, what we want is, uh, to continue to work with our membership on prioritizing, zeroing on where our contribution can be most uh, effective. And one thing I would finish with the uh, good news from the membership. Our members are telling us everything is on the table. You come to us if you need uh, uh, to do more of something, we are there for you. Great. My colleague Rob has some questions on the issue you mentioned on the debt initiative, the debt suspension standstill issue. Rob, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, yeah. I know the, let's talk about the G20 debt service suspension mm -hmm. initiative. I mean, it was intended to help provide space to respond to the crisis for 73 vulnerable countries. I think uh, some 40 of them have, have stepped up. It's helpful mm -hmm. and provided a bit of breathing space, but, um, you know, it obviously it clearly won't be enough, uh, a debt standstill mm -hmm. for, for a number of these countries, notably in Africa. H how tricky do you think any restructuring negotiations will be in this new era, especially when you have this whole new uh, player, which is the state-backed Chinese lenders uh, and involved in the, in the uh, negotiations, who are all, in some cases, are owed significant amounts more than, than multilateral mm -hmm. lenders. How do, we, how, does, how do you get the global community to get China to fully on board mm -hmm. with this? Well, the um, um, uh, importance of China joining this G20 in, uh, initiative should not be underestimated. This is the first time when China, and for that matter also Gulf countries, uh, others, uh, other non-Paris Club members, have agreed to act 
in a multilateral setting. Why is this significant? Because, uh, as you rightly point out, their role is increasing, and we know from experience that Solving problems in a multilateral setting is much more effective than everybody doing it on their own. I am with the impression that the world still has not uh, given the right attention to the fact that we do now have a G20, if you wish, official uh, creditors forum. Uh, and it is very important that we work towards uh, retaining that format uh, and making sure that it stays for the uh, future, not just in this very critical moment uh, in time. We saw uh, that uh, uh, there was a reflection on this question in China at the highest level. Uh, President Xi Jinping uh, on the 17th of June uh, in his uh, uh, meeting with African leaders, the China-Africa summit uh, on COVID, uh, made some uh, very important um, uh, announcements uh, that uh, uh, he wants to continue, China wants to continue to work uh, with uh, others in a multilateral uh, setting, that there may be a case to expand, uh, sorry, to extend the, um, uh, this uh, uh, debt service suspension initiative, and that, 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 that they, are, they are encouraging Chinese institutions uh, to work in a constructive way with uh, countries uh, uh, towards uh, resolution of debt issues. Uh, for us, what is very important to stress is that uh, we see this engagement uh, uh, with China uh, as one, but not the only one, uh, that would determine whether we are in a position to avoid the uh, uh, kinds of... Uh, uh, unruly behaviors uh, that, uh, that, uh, that get to be known as disorderly defaults. Uh, what is else that we need to worry about? Well, there is another player that is very important, much more important than a couple of uh, decades ago, and this is private sector. Uh, if you look at the structure of debt of, say, African countries, in many of them, uh, uh, Eurobond uh, issuance, uh, Private, uh, private sector um, loans, they are sometimes bigger than anything uh, else. Uh, and so we have to work systematically towards a way in which uh, debt issues can be resolved with as little scarring for the countries themselves and for the financial system as possible. W today, we have the Paris Club as the one and only institution that has long-standing principles on the basis of which they engage. And we have to build up these kinds of principles uh, in, a, in a broader sense. And I, and I can tell you for the fund, uh, we see our role being uh, one of constructive engagement uh, because we are the institution that by the uh, virtue of our mandate, our global surveillance mandate and our engagement with countries on a regular basis can contribute uh, quite significantly on a case-by-case -case basis, as well as in terms of building these uh, principles. I mean, it sort of raises a question. I mean, you have an ongoing restructuring, which is Argentina, essentially. I mean, does the IMF think that Argentina will reach an eventual deal with creditors? And does your analysis support the idea that the country which has been argued that they can't, they can't pay more um, or at this point. And when do you see Argentina agreeing a new deal with the fund itself to replace the, the $57 billion credit facility? Um, I mean, how could that be accelerated given the current conditions and context? The uh, uh, discussions uh, among, uh, between uh, Argentina and the creators are ongoing. We are not a party of, of these discussions, right. have never been, will never be. Uh, where we are is um, uh, we have been uh, asked by Argentina to provide technical assistance in the form of uh, uh, assessing uh, their uh, debt. Uh, we did it, and the conclusion was twofold. One, uh, that is not sustainable. I don't think anybody was surprised by this uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, 
Uh, and two, we determined on the basis of uh, uh, some assumptions, what would it take for that to be sustainable? Uh, it is uh, an is useful input, but it is not the uh, determinant of uh, where the uh, discussions uh, will go. Uh, I would add, I mean, w when I said that my, what I learned as a crisis commissioner, pray for the best, prepare for the worst. In this case, I pray for the best. I really hope that there will be a, a good outcome in the interest of both uh, uh, Argentina, the region, um, actually the, the world economy in these days, but also in the interest of the creditors. Uh, so let's see where that would go. In any case, uh, we are there to help uh, countries, uh, especially when they are faced with dif difficulties. We are there. Uh, Argentina has already stated that they are uh, going to come uh, to the fund uh, for a program, and uh, we will do our best to support uh, uh, an economic reform uh, program for Argentina that is good for growth, good for private sector, because it is the private sector that generates uh, most of it and the jobs uh, uh, that the country needs. And it is good for poverty reduction. Argentina has seen a very high increase of poverty, uh, and that is not healthy for any society. Uh, so when time comes, uh, we will be, uh, of course, uh, uh, focused on doing our best to support uh, uh, these aspirations of the people of uh, Argentina. Not in, a, in, a, in an easy place. Our growth projections for Argentina uh, for 2020 minus 9.9 percent. Uh, and that uh, comes uh, uh, on the top of, uh, of uh, an economy that has been uh, having, um, having uh, difficulties. Uh, but it is uh, a country with tremendous potential. Everybody knows that. So can, can Argentina put an end of the boom-bust cycle? I very much hope uh, the answer can be uh, framed in the next, uh, in the next uh, months and years, and uh, that the fund can say, here is the program that finally got Argentina out of it. Thanks. Swala. Let me, we're getting loads of questions um, in, uh, yeah. so uh, we'll try and ask some of those shortly. Let me move back to something you were saying around um, the creditors um, in Africa, to Africa, but also um, there is something to be done perhaps about the transparency of the borrowing that is done. So let me ask mm -hmm. you, how can we improve the transparency around Africa borrowing, not just from China, but also to mm -hmm. avoid cases like the, the Mozambique tuna bonds, which I know you, you remember. Yep. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the, uh, look, tr transparency is absolutely uh, uh, paramount for countries to succeed. Uh, it is accountability to the citizens. Uh, Yes, we would like to see uh, that transparency much more massively expanding. Uh, we work very closely with the World Bank. Actually, we had the debt transparency initiative even before this coronavirus crisis hit the world. Uh, and we see now at the point when debt is going up uh, to record levels, even more important to make sure that everybody can see who the lender is, what the conditions uh, are, and then compare these conditions uh, to what uh, is uh, likely to be a fair uh, deal. Uh, we will be uh, building up, the, the World Bank has already put it out, we will be building up an expanding database uh, that would help uh, with uh, that transparency at the fund we actually are very keen that, that we are driving this agenda for the benefit of economic performance and social inclusion of countries. Uh, and of course, also for the benefit of our own institutional reputation. That's great. Um, Rob, I don't know, we have a lot of questions coming through. Shall yeah, we take I mean, I, so, so one thing I was thinking, most global economic forecasts excluded the sort of the possibility that um, leaders of some of the biggest countries, I'm thinking the US or Brazil, would get their response wrong or their reopening. 
you know, ignoring science or whatever and allowing the virus to spread unchecked. And we're starting to see some evidence of that in the States. Are you, are you concerned or are you guys doing any analysis into, analysis into what might happen if I don't know, tens of thousands or thousands more U.S. or Brazilian citizens die? And, and, if, and if other countries don't allow Americans or Brazilians to travel across borders onto their state airlines and, or even disrupt trade given, I mean, we just saw that the European Union is considering uh, extending um, you know, the, the uh, restrictions on Americans, for instance, visiting Europe. I mean, are you, is there a sense that the, the responses, not, I'm not talking about fiscal and monetary, but other responses have, are creating problems for the fiscal and monetary um, forecasts? We, uh, we are factoring in in our projections uh, both an upside and a downside uh, scenarios. Uh, on the upside, if there is a breakthrough that comes earlier, and on the downside, if actually that containment is less effective, we have a second uh, wave, uh, our ability to handle it uh, is not sufficient. Uh, so. Uh, uh, yes, we are looking into what it would be if uh, we have responsible reopening and what it might be if uh, reopenings are done in a uh, less uh, uh, responsible uh, manner. Uh, what I want to stress, the biggest thing that, uh, that differentiates uh, our posture in April, our setup uh, in projections in April and today, is actually the recognition that we will have to have recovery going on while the virus is still with us. In April, there was still, I hope, expectation, I don't know what to call it, that there will be end of the pandemic and recovery. Now what we know is that there is going to be in 2020 some partial recovery while the pandemic is still uh, with us. And also what we know is that uh, uh, the um, uh, epidemiological uh, models are much more granulated because the health experts now understand this uh, uh, better. Uh, and so something that we have never done in the fund, uh, well, there is always a first time for everything. We are building in our macroeconomic uh, models also epidemiological projections. And to finish on your question, and obviously these projections integrate different degree of effectiveness of measures taken in uh, especially systemically uh, significant economies. Well, our, our epidemiologists as good or as bad at forecasting as economists, I guess, is the next question. <laughs> um, well, per perhaps I would say epidemiologists like economists have two hands on one hand and on another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, let's, let's go to some of the questions. We do. I mean, it's amazing how many are pouring through. One question, I'll just hit it right on, is Lebanon. Um, I mean, the question is sort of where, where do things stand? Are we going to see some sort of um, agreement uh, in terms of aid and help to resolve the problems uh, in, in, in Lebanon? Uh, we are engaged with Lebanon. They uh, uh, put the request uh, to the fund uh, to work on their program uh, with the objective of um, stabilizing the economy. Uh, it is not yet at the point when I can uh, deliver some uh, uh, categorical good news uh, uh, on that front. Uh, it has been uh, uh, really uh, difficult. Uh, and the core of the issue is uh, whether there can be unity of purpose in the country that can then carry forward a set of very tough but necessary uh, measures. Uh, all I can say is that uh, we are putting uh, uh, our best people to work uh, with Lebanon, uh, but we do not yet have uh, a reason to say there is a break uh, breakthrough. Uh, 
Uh, and I'll tell you, it breaks my heart. Lebanon, Lebanon is a country that um, um, has um, entrepreneurial people. It's a country that has been doing um, service to the world by hosting refugees, uh, Palestinian refugees now, a huge number of uh, Syrian refugees. Um, it is clear what needs to be done, uh, but it is the doing, coming in this unity of doing it uh, that we need to still work on. Thank you. Let me pop in with um, something one of the audience has asked about the world is addicted to debt. How do we fix it? Now, it's not just the world addicted to debt. Financial markets, as you alluded to, are also addicted to central bank policy stimulus. It's much harder to unwind stimulus than to dole it out in the first place. Mm. How, as the question asked, do we fix that addiction? And how long do you think it will take mm. before we can even contemplate removing stimulus? Mm. So uh, uh, let me start uh, with the question, uh, how long? Uh, it would take quite some time um, to get uh, to a point when we are through this crisis and on the other, on the other side. Uh, as long as uh, we do not have scientific uh, breakthrough, uh, as long as the uh, pandemic has not uh, uh, retreated uh, uh, in fullest, uh, we would have this uh, uh, combination of uh, push and pull measures to reopen cautiously and then perhaps to, uh, to correct. Uh, and at that time, it is important to have accommodative policy if inflation expectations are well anchored and are low, uh, and, uh, and to have fiscal support so we don't see massive collapse uh, of businesses and uh, massive and possibly long-term structural unemployment. Now, when, when we look at the um, uh, measures in place, um, we have been saying two things, and let me repeat them. Number one, spend as much as you need and you can to protect your people and your economy, but keep the receipts. Make sure that this is done not willy-nilly, but it is well targeted. And two, put measures in place that can be pulled out, that are temporary in nature. And that goes to the heart of your question. The most dangerous thing is to have a uh, uh, system of support that is not needed anymore but it is not withdrawn because it adds to debt and to deficits uh, without doing a constructive service uh, to the economy. Now, how can we turn the switch uh, off on this increase of debt and deficits? Well, only if the economy is growing again. Uh, and that growth uh, is not such a, uh, you know illusion. We actually have not destroyed the economy. We just put it on standstill. Uh, and therefore, it can uh, restart. It is not like uh, uh, our you know, physical infrastructure is uh, totally destroyed or people uh, within massively are now missing from the economy. But what we have to be uh, mindful of that there are engines of growth that are possible to give this momentum uh, digital first and foremost. We have seen uh, anything that is tech is doing very well in the markets, not because of the Fed, but because of the uh, uh, role that, that these industries uh, play in our economy. And we know that we have another massive crisis to wrestle with, the climate crisis. It requires a massive injection of both public and private uh, investments that can be the generator of uh, jobs and, and growth and help us to then prevent this debt built up, uh, uh, not only to continue, but can help us to melt down deficits and debt. It does require commitment and determination of policymakers in each and every country and it does require global cooperation. 
I am, I am so keen to see us doing more together than, than trying to, um, to kind of act on our own. Um, you know, we have to all wake up. We are in this totally uh, together. So, uh, here's a question that came in. It's interesting. What is the response of the IMF to domestic social unrest? And, mm. and the, 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 the questioner points out that uh, right outside your window in Washington, mm -hmm. you can probably see some evidence of this. I mean, how do you see, how do you interpret what's happening, particularly in the United States, um, with respect to, you know, your views on the economy and, and, and this idea that you long talked about, about merging from this with a more equitable economy mm -hmm. um, globally? Well, the, uh, the uh, 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 movement uh, on racial discrimination to say enough is enough uh, in the United States uh, is uh, grounded uh, in realities in the country. Not only there is systemic uh, racism, but there is structural racism. In other words, you are born in a neighborhood that is uh, poor. You go to a school that is uh, not very good. Your health system is not very effective. The jobs you can apply for are not particularly uh, well-paying jobs. And that is not uprooted in the United States. It actually ex exists in other places uh, as well. It is bad for the people that are excluded, that are pushed aside. But it is bad for the economy as a whole because what we do is we shrink our talent base, and we are less productive as a result. Uh, but I want to expand this because in the United States right now, it is about racial discrimination. We have to be genuinely concerned about inequalities, about discrimination of any kind, gender discrimination, uh, discrimination uh, on the basis uh, of your religion in some places. Whenever discrimination exists, whenever exclusion exists, it takes away from the well-being of the society as a whole. And, and what I want to state that we have to keep in mind is that what family, what circumstances you are born in is lottery. Huh? Whether you're born in a rich family or a poor family, whether you are black or white, whether you are a man or a woman, that's lottery. 400,000 kids born every day. But it should not be lottery whether you can reach your full potential. And I look at, uh, at myself, well, I was born in communist Bulgaria. Today, I am the head of the IMF. This is what possibility, what opportunity looks like. How did I get there? Education, first and foremost. Uh, and it is uh, that kind of notion that, that we have to create opportunities and that access to quality education, quality health care, in other words, investment in people equally to everyone, this is what is untapped growth potential for the whole uh, world. And this is why I so strongly believe we have to use this crisis to shift gear, address inequalities where they exist, uproot them. Swaha, I'll give you one question, then I'll ask the last one. I think that we've got all, all we've got time for. Sure. One of the ones that's recurring on our feed is about the disconnect you've talked about already at the start between the real economy where we are now and financial markets. I mean, some of that disconnect is also helping to ease financial market conditions for borrowing and all sorts of other things. So it's not necessarily a bad thing for the real economy. Having mm -hmm. said that, do you see any repercussions, any risks building? Again, you alluded to them. What do we have to be careful about and what risks are we running by allowing this to continue? Mm. Uh, I, I want to uh, very much reinforce what you said about this is positive. Uh, when we have uh, markets calm, 
when we have people uh, confident that uh, their life life sa savings uh, invested in whichever way are there for them, that helps consumer conf confidence, uh, which has dipped very significantly during this uh, uh, crisis. Uh, and also what it signals is that uh, the um, uh, function of the financial system to move money to productive use uh, is well, uh, well supported. Uh, what is the risk? The risk is uh, if we are to have a um, second wave, no medical breakthroughs, prolonged recession, uh, or if the expectation for central banks being there further is less realistic than what central banks are going to do, or we have geopolitical shocks of some nature, then we may see abrupt contraction, and that is a risk. Uh, what all we are saying at, at the fund is uh, uh, be mindful of this, uh, of this risk uh, and to be able to uh, act accordingly. And just yesterday, we saw the Fed doing something that in a small way is towards um, managing this risk. Uh, they have uh, re uh, reflected on stress tests of the banking system. Sure enough, this is not the market. This is just the, uh, the banking uh, uh, segment of the market. Uh, they have prudently assessed uh, where, it, where the stress tests are leading. Uh, they have taken a, a decision to um, uh, reduce um, uh, dividend uh, and, and uh, buybacks uh, for, for, for some banks, for a universe of 34, if I remember correctly. This is exactly what we want to see, that we are not, there is no reason to be, to be uh, uh, panicked, but we have to be on the alert and scan the horizon so we can take appropriate uh, measures. The most important message from our latest update to policymakers, be agile. At the time of uncertainty, take the temperature, use uh, data uh, points, and then adjust your policies accordingly. So one, we haven't talked about this, but it's sort of the, the, big, the big question out there, which is, climate change. As you wrote, or you mm. spoke, I think, to the, uh, a delegation from Italy recently, you said uh, climate change is real. We may have to put it on the back burner during the crisis, but it is still with us. I tell you, everyone, if you don't like the pandemic, you're not going to like the climate crisis when it comes. Um, I guess, uh, you know, when I think about it, that is going to be, this is a run through. This is kind of a test mm. for, the, for the world, world leaders. Can we pull together? Because this is not a one single country event, nor would be the climate crisis. Um, are you confident, or what, what gives you confidence, I should suggest, suggesting I don't have the confidence, but that, that the world is going to do a better job when it comes to this longer burn, you know, more exist, arguably more existential um, threat in the next 10, 20 years. What gives you confidence, Kristalina, okay. that we're going to be able to do it? The uh, young people give me a lot of confidence. What I see is the uh, generation that is going to be most severely hit by the climate uh, uh, crisis is not willing anymore to be uh, uh, silent on this topic. Um, what gives me uh, confidence is the fact that uh, policymakers in many countries uh, at this time of the pandemic are saying, as we put forward uh, uh, stimulus packages, to restore growth, we have to make sure that growth is low carbon climate resilient. Uh, you listen to the um, uh, EU, uh, the European leaders, and this is front and center in their strategy for revival uh, from the pandemic, and rightly so. In other words, what gives me hope is that we have to restart growth, and climate action is a great win-win proposition when it comes down to uh, uh, wise use of public money and huge opportunities for private investments. Uh, let's remember that the New Climate Economy Commission came up with a simple statement. Investing in low-carbon climate-resilient growth is a 
fabulous way to boost your profitability and uh, to create jobs, 65 million jobs easily to be created through climate uh, actions. Uh, and I, because I know that on the other side, we will be faced with a very serious problem about unemployment. And I know that there are a number of activities on the climate front that are job rich, uh, whether we talk about reforestation, uh, land degradation, uh, buildings, insulation, or the uh, uh, generation of uh, uh, low, uh, uh, low carbon uh, businesses and activities, many of them are exactly what we would need at the time when, uh, when, uh, when we would be faced with uh, unemployment. I mean, right? let's face it, right now we are sure. talking about 10, 15 percent unemployment numbers. We want to go down to four. So go green, do well short term and protect our future long term. Well, Kristalina, thank you very much. Appreciate you spending time with us and with our audience. Appreciate the audience for sending in so many great questions um, and really appreciate your proactive approach being out there and communicating. Um, it's, it, I think it helps people understand how we're dealing with this crisis. So without further ado, please go and help save the world. Thank you in advance. <laughs> thank you for having thank me. You.